Hi everyone, uh, this is the first part of the second lecture in the Biofuels course. Um, it is actually a journal club. You will also be required to do your own journal club presentations later on in the course, but I will give more information in that regard. So this journal club is on a paper by, uh, called uh, The Production of uh, Liquid Biofuels from Renewable Sources by uh, Nigaman Singh. It was published back in 2011, so it's actually a little bit older than the papers I like to use in the course. Uh, but because it covers such a large scope of different types of biofuels and uh, production uh, methodologies, I decided to keep using it uh, for this year. So the article starts with an introduction um, where they say the, that uh, the increasing industrialization and motorization of the world has led to a rise in the demand, demand of petroleum-based fuels. I read recently that they are selling uh, four times as many cars per year in India than they did 20 years ago. And in China, it's over 20 times the amount of cars that they're selling now uh, compared to 20 years ago. Um, and so this obviously leads to a big increase in the demand for petrol. So over 80% of the primary energy used in the world is uh, from fossil fuels. And over half of that is consumed in the transport sector these days. So the sources of those fossil fuels are becoming more exhausted or more difficult to mine and uh, they contribute to greenhouse gas emissions which of course have all kinds of detrimental environmental impacts. So this requires us to move to a alternative, renewable, sustainable, uh, efficient and cost effective energy source uh, that also has less emissions. So among many alternatives, uh, biofuels, hydrogen and syngas or synthesis gas may emerge as the most likely candidates among these alternative types of fuels. So within those, biofuels then are the most environmentally friendly energy source. Biofuels they define in the article as liquid, gas or solid fuels that are predominantly produced from biomass or a, a biological feedstock. So current technologies, those that are uh, existing uh, um, at commercial scale already and also under development uh, for the production of biofuels requires the hydrolysis of uh, cellulose for linking cellulose with biomass to sugar substrates in order to produce uh, bioethanol or biobutanol. It um, can also be via the transesterification of natural oils and fats to biodiesel. Uh, via pyrolysis or gasification as, as, um, as thermal treatments uh, for biological materials to produce a number of different, um, uh, different types of fuels. So they have this figure in the article which I think is, is quite convoluted and, and difficult to follow so I'm not going to go into it in, in full detail but also based on what we've learned in the first lecture uh, I do want to highlight some of these um, technologies that exist, some of the different ways of producing biofuels, um, both that are under development and that are at, at commercial scale production already. So we've mentioned um, that we can use oils from plants and then through a transesterification process produce a biodiesel. Um, we've mentioned that we can use su sugars from sugarcane or sugar beet or starches which has to be hydrolyzed by enzymes first um, to release free sugars that can be fermented to ethanol. That would be a first generation type of uh, biofuel. We could also use biomass, which can be fractionated into cellulose, hemicellulose cellulose and lignin. And those cellulose and hemicellulose fractions can be um, sacrificed to sugars either through, through using uh, acids or enzymes. And those sugars can then be fermented and used to produce ethanol as well. That would be a second generation type of biofuel. Um, alternatively to those biological methods, we have um, the, the uh, thermochemical methods such as uh, gasification, which can be used to produce a syngas. And that syngas can be either fermented to ethanol directly or through uh, fischer tropsch processes, it can be turned into different types of uh, finished fuels such as diesel or gasoline or uh, jet fuels. Although we did mention that with those types of processes, there are, uh, when you're using biomass as a feedstock, um, certain problems that you run into, such as, um, uh, such as fouling uh, and precipitation, 
Okay, so um, we move on to a classification of biofuels um, and we basically differentiate between a primary and a secondary type of biofuel. A primary biofuel would be something where you're using your biofuel in an unprocessed form. So you have, uh, you're using uh, fuel wood or wood chips or pellets for simple uh, heating, cooking or electricity production. Your secondary biofuels would be those there that you've processed in some way before you use them. So you've turned uh, a sugar substrate into uh, ethanol, um, a, a uh, oil substrate into biodiesel, or you've turned your, uh, your biomass into biogas before using it. And those can be used in uh, vehicles or in various industrial processes. So secondary biofuels are further divided into first, second and third generation biofuels. And that's, uh, as we've mentioned in the first lecture, on the basis of raw material um, and the technology used for their production. So here's a handy little scheme. Um, primary biofuels are, as we said, wood and, and derivative products of wood that can basically be burned uh, directly. Uh, your secondary biofuels are classified as first, second or third generation, where first generation is your um, bioethanol or butanol that are fermented uh, from the sugars in, in seeds or grains or maybe sugar from sugarcane. Your biodiesel in, in the first generation is made from plant oils. For second generation biofuels, your uh, main substrate would be lignocellulosic biomass and you would produce bioethanol or butanol um, again by a fermentation process but after a pretreatment and an enzymatic hydrolysis of that uh, feedstock and we'll see a little bit more uh, about that as we go on or it could be uh, biomethane in other words a biogas made in an anaerobic digester from uh, lignocellulosic biomass and then considered third generation biofuels are made from algae and uh, oleaginous uh, yeasts also fall into this category and you're using those organisms to produce the oil um, that you will then transesterify to a biodiesel. So there are several advantages and disadvantages to biofuels that we've also discussed previously and I'm not uh, going to go through this entire table point by point but I would like to highlight some of them. On, on uh, the benefits column um, we mentioned energy security um, most countries in the world have to import uh, fossil fuels for the production of their own uh, transport fuels, for example, um, which is a challenge to energy security. You, 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 your country doesn't produce all of the energy that you actually require. So a biofuel that you produce locally would be a domestic energy source. You can distribute it locally as required and you can connect your supply and demand chain um, as is optimal in your country which leads to higher reliability of your fuel use. Um, it can improve the country's, uh, a country's economic stability. You can have greater uh, price stability. Um, you're not reliant on, on, on the, uh, or you, yeah, you, you don't have that much of an effect of the, the big fluctuations that you could have for oil prices. Um, of course, for, especially for developing countries, it's very important um, to, to produce biofuels in terms of employment generation and rural development and agricultural development. Um, and it can have all kinds of uh, positive benefits in that case. And it also gets away from the monopoly of fossil fuels um, by these uh, fossil rich states. And we've mentioned a number of environmental gains already. Um, with biofuels, you can have better waste utilization with not all of your waste material going into landfill. You can have um, thereby produce or reduce a lot of uh, local pollution. You can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um, generally improve your, your, uh, your waste management by valorizing that waste into a product um, that is actually a big benefit to you. Some challenges exist, as we know. Um, your feedstock has to be collected somewhere, it has to be transported, it has to be stored, um, and that all adds to the cost of your biofuel. You have to um, consider that there's this comp possible competition uh, between food production and, and, and fuel production. Um, so, as I've said, there are good and bad ways of producing biofuels. There's still a lot of technology challenges in biofuels production. 
we have to improve uh, things like the pretreatment of the material. We'll see more detail about that. The enzyme production and the efficiency of those uh, product uh, of those enzymes, um, and the 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 transformation of your feedstock into your product overall. So uh, this technology cost is still relatively high, and it has to be improved uh, quite dramatically in order for your second generation biofuel, especially to be uh, competitive with your fossil based fuels. Um, there are also some important policy decisions that countries have to make in things like uh, uh, land use change that um, land that is used to produce food doesn't suddenly only get used to produce fuel, um, such as uh, policies for biofuels to, to allow um, countries that are to, to basically mandate the use of a biofuel to a certain percentage. This will help the biofuel production market uh, to grow and, and with that the, um, the facilities um, and the technology used in those facilities will improve over time. But that has to be mandated by, by government. And then things like tax credits for the production and utilization of biofuels can be used to bring down the cost of biofuels and make them more competitive uh, with, uh, with um, fossil-based fuels. Okay, so first generation biofuels then, um, these as we said are generally produced from sugars, uh, grains or seeds, especially in the, for, for biodiesel from those seed oils. Um, ethanol is made by fermenting uh, sugar extracted from a crop, so that would be like sugar cane or sugar beet or from starch contained in starchy crops like maize, those have to be hydrolyzed first to release the, the fermentable sugar. Bioethanol is then produced by yeast enzymes. Essentially, it's a yeast fermentation process um, that turns your mainly glucose into ethanol. So initially, the sugar of the raw materials has to be separated. So for starches, you also, as I said, have to hydrolyze those using heat and enzymes to release the glucose. And then you have fermentation by the yeast that converts that glucose into ethanol. And then you have your distillation process and dehydration process to remove uh, the, the, the last little bit of water after the distillation. And then you have to transport that to your, uh, you get your ethanol and that has to be transported to where it's going to be used. Uh, or it has to be blended with fossil fuels. Okay, so we have a, a little scheme of that. Um, we have uh, start off with our uh, sugar source and if this is um, a starch source this has to be ground down uh, water is added and then you heat up um, the mixture in a jet cooker where you add your first batch of enzymes called an alpha amylase and this is what we call liquefaction this is the initial uh, start of the breakdown of those starch polymers um, you then, after uh, cooling down, after the liquefaction stage, you add glucoamylase. That's the, uh, the other uh, amylolytic enzyme that we require. And that releases all of the remaining um, sugar so that we have free uh, glucose. Then you can add your yeast for your fermentation process. And then uh, finally you have your alcohol recovery process, which is distillation and dehydration, from where you can blend your fuel or use the ethanol directly. Okay, um, first generation biodiesel, as we said, this is produced from vegetable oils uh, of uh, oleaginous plants by transesterification. That transesterification can use an alkaline uh, acid or enzymatic catalyst um, and then ethanol or methanol uh, for the transesterification. So it produces a fatty acid, which is essentially a biodiesel and a glycerol byproduct. So both first generation bioethanol and biodiesel then, as we can see, uses a very small fraction of the plant biomass and leaves most of the plant biomass intact. We're only using the seed or only using the sugar part of the plant. The rest of the plant doesn't get used in first generation uh, biofuel production. So second generation biofuel production, um, the, this is produced by a fundamentally different approach. Um, and also we can we can produce these fuels uh, by different approaches which can be either biological um, or thermochemical so the feedstocks um, are normally non-edible residues of food crop so that's kind of agricultural waste um, 
or non-edible whole plant biomass. So that is when you um, perhaps grow grasses on marginal land or some kind of other um, lignocellulosic biomass um, that you wouldn't have eaten anyway. So we consider those energy crops. The advantage of that is, of course, that it limits the direct food versus fuel competition. If we are producing a certain amount of maize uh, on a certain amount of land, we're still getting the, 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 the maize uh, for food production, but it's everything else on the plant that remains after, um, uh, after the maize has been removed um, that we then use for second generation um, biofuel production. So that's the advantage there. We're basically limiting that uh, competition between food and fuel. Of course, there's a greater amount of above ground uh, plant that can be used and converted into your biofuel. So it's a highly increased land use efficiency. And production of second generation biofuel requires uh, sophisticated equipment. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks. It can't be really be done at, at a small scale, especially if we're talking at uh, ethanol production. You need a large investment, you need large scale facilities to enable that uh, economy of scale and um, reduce the production of the ethanol cost in, in that case um, to where it is competitive with or more competitive with fossil fuels. So we need a lot of further research on uh, feedstock production and the entire uh, conversion technologies, the entire value chain from getting the plant um, to actually uh, distributing the biofuel. Um, research along all of those different uh, parts are required. So um, just quickly on the thermochemical biomass conversion processes, uh, we have mentioned uh, pyrolysis and, and uh, gasification um, in the first lecture as well. And we said that um, these require very high temperatures and pressures and um, ha also has to be done at very large scale. But you do get greater flexibility in feedstock that can be used. You can basically mix any type of lignocellulosic feedstock um, into this process because you are going to, in, the, 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 um, in the, the gasification procedure at least, going to turn all of that into, um, into carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So uh, it's a flexible process and you can also produce through the fischer drobes processes more diverse uh, fuels you can make ethanol or you can actually make uh, petrol, you can make a, a type of diesel um, and a number of others. But the gasification is a lot more capital intensive and requires a large scale production for an economic benefit. Um, after the, the fischer tropes processes, uh, after that syngas production through gasification, we can get a, as I mentioned, a clean finished fuel uh, petrol, diesel, or jet fuel, whatever we might be required to make. And many second generation thermochemical fuels are currently being uh, com produced commercially from fossil fuels. So um, there are examples of, of these types of fuels that are being made. They include methanol, uh, refined fischer tropes liquids, and uh, dimethyl ether. Uh, a lot of these can be blended into uh, petrol as well. Um, increasing the amount of uh, biofuels that a country uses without having to change the entire vehicle fleet. Okay, uh, pyrolysis is the other thermochemical biomass con conversion technique that we mentioned. This is done under vacuum, uh, slightly lower temperatures than gasification. Gasification would happen at about 800 degrees Celsius, whereas pyrolysis is around 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, pyrolysis happens in the absence of oxygen though, and um, it produces a type of oil um, which is a very unrefined oil and requires a lot of uh, additional upscaling or refining uh, before it can actually be used in conventional engines. So this isn't really an option um, that is being used at, at, at large scale. Third generation liquid biofuels, this is where you have your oleaginous yeasts or fungi or most commonly researched microalgae. Um, that can be used as a potential source for biodiesel. Um, and this is because they can biosynthesize and store large amounts of fatty acids in their biomass. Microalgae can fix environmental carbon dioxide and it can produce lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates in large quantities over relatively short amounts of time. That's why they are so attractive. Uh, 
Um, some strains also have very high lipid content. Uh, 20 to 50 percent uh, of their dry weight can can be lipids, um, which can be enhanced and optimized by uh, or can be enhanced by optimized growth conditions. So those products can then be processed into biofuels and valuable co-products. Um, currently, microalgae are grown at large scale to uh, extract very high value uh, fatty acids. But it is thought that um, apart from that, we could also actually use the, the oils for biofuels production. So under natural growth conditions, phototrophic microalgae require primarily three components to produce biomass, and that is water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. And the advantages of this algal biodiesel would be that microalgae can live in a variety of environmental conditions, uh, fresh water and marine water commonly, and therefore they would require less arable land. So the idea is if you use uh, a, a marine algae, um, you can use uh, an area close to the sea um, that can't necessarily be used for food production, uh, and you have a water source for that as well. Unfortunately, those species of them don't tend to be the ones that, that really um, amass that much oil. So you can still theoretically produce higher oil per hectare yields uh, with microalgae than with conventional crops. Um, they do not compete with food production. They uh, can remove carbon dioxide um, and nitrates from industrial flue gases by biofixation. You can be a you can apply them also uh, similarly to, to grow on waste water um, and remove uh, ammonia and uh, nitrite and sulfite um, out of uh, that wastewater. And those uh, algae biodiesel, uh, of course, also doesn't contain sulfur and, so it, and also performs as well as petroleum diesel while reducing emissions. So a lot of good reasons to investigate algal biofuels further. Um, however, for efficient oil production from algae, you should be able to accumulate more than 30% of the total cell weight in oil. And um, that means that you run into certain problems um, with algae because if you do want to use wastewater, uh, you do want to use flue gases, um, and you still want to, uh, you do want to use marine water, you, your, your main problem is that you still have to accumulate a lot of biomass and 30% of that biomass or more has to be oil. And so um, that is where the main problem is for algal biofuels um, to try and, and, and hit all of those goals. So main research in the optimization of algae biofuels is the selection of more efficient algal strains. Um, strains that can grow in these different difficult conditions um, while still producing a lot of, of oil. And then the best cultivation methods of those selected strains uh, for uh, at, at their optimal growth rates. Uh, optimizing cultivation in cheap sources such as the carbon dioxide, as we said, from, from flue gases, from factories, uh, nutrient-rich wastewaters, and uh, using inexpensive uh, fertilizers. And in, in that way, if you can, can crack that difficult problem, you can basically, it's, it's, it's a double whammy, it's a double win. Um, you can further, you can produce a biofuel while also uh, reducing waste um, from factories. We need, though, cheaper cultivation systems. As we mentioned, uh, the race ponds, the raceways uh, for, um, for producing algae work well, but we don't really get high enough production of uh, biomass or high enough accumulation of, of the oil to make it uh, worthwhile for producing a fuel. We do need to also uh, have some metabolic engineering uh, in these species to produce cells that are saturated with a more desirable lipid, a most desirable lipid for bioethanol, uh, sorry, biodiesel production. And we need optimized methods of uh, harvesting and drying of the biomass. Um, the lipid extraction methods also differ slightly depending on the different algal species and the different cultivation ways. So we also need optimization of that uh, lipid extraction process. And um, with the different types of oil, um, also inherently you have to optimize your trans-esterification process. I said 
we can use um, ethanol or methanol we can use um, different types of catalysts um, such as bases or acids and which combination um, may change um, which combination is optimal may change depending on the type of oil you're producing and your harvesting method is there still a lot of water in that mix etc 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 okay i'm going to end uh, this first part of the lecture here in the second part of the lecture we will uh, look more specifically at the production of the different types of biofuels